In order to really get to know the Night Hags, the eternal grey misery of the three major realms of Hades and the thriving markets of despicable evil where Yugoloths willingly transform themselves into fiendish magic weapons, first we have to understand that the most commonly encountered species in Hades are the Dyak, and it is unavoidable to compare them, so let's just call them Hades chickens. I mean, their origin is magically transformed chickens formerly owned by the hag fey lord Baba Yaga. Baba Yaga is not the mother of all hags though. That would be the hag goddess Sigilun, an excellent example of what happens to a goddess and her most powerful servants when all her worshippers get murdered. In the hag mother's case, well, I shall just read to you directly from the Forgotten Realms wiki page on her as it covers her history and the origin of the different hag breeds, according to legend that is. And I quote, Sigilun was thought to be related to the other sylvan deities in some way and was allegedly Titania's sister. Although given the existence of the Queen of Air and Darkness, this claim was somewhat suspect. There was definitely some relation between the two, with a widely held belief, even among gods, being that Titania and Sigilun were as light and darkness, and that to destroy one was to destroy the other. Others claimed that Sigilun was simply a supremely powerful night hag with god-level powers, like Baba Yaga. And it was also purported that she was the mother of the night hag race. Some theorized she had gifted them with the ability to create Ultraloths, so that they could maintain their dominance over the Grey Wastes, although given her apathy towards them, this tale was often discounted. Given that hags are a race of narcissists with a penchant for deception, any claims regarding their history were self-aggrandizing interpretations at best, and blatant lies at worst. Still, a myth held for the longest time by ogres and hill giants, which given Grow Lantors, supposed dalliances with Sigilun were at least notable potentially gave some hints regarding the true nature of Sigilun and the Hag. When the world was dark and young, the fearful races prayed for protection from things that haunted the night, and in response came the existence of the moon and the queen to rule its light, Sigilun. Worship of the silver-haired beauty, said to be as fickle as the moon itself, quickly spread across the world to many races, and the moon goddess received huge fear and love from her worshippers. Sigilun adopted as her daughters those followers who constantly courted her favour, the most pious and physically pleasing priestesses whose attractive forms reminded Sigilun of her own. To them, Sigilun gifted powers to further her glory. She granted her prophets the power to walk on water to spread her word. Her evangelists, called songs, were granted beautiful voices to compel others to worship, and her protectors the strength to protect other followers from attack. However, the indulgent Sigilun made the mistake of growing complacent in her status, basking in worship while rarely expending the effort to assist her followers. Only when her supposed eternal beauty was marred by the first wrinkle did she realise this miscalculation, as beside her devout daughters all her former worshippers had moved on. The deities of distant lands were able to appeal to these embittered by the moon goddess's vanity and neglect who took pride in their divine patrons and the power that came from their new allegiances. The moon goddess's good sense was eclipsed by a thirst for blood and vengeance when faced with abandonment and mockery. So she sent her remaining daughters, now aged and weakened by the waning of her worship, to enact a crusade. They slaughtered hundreds of her former worshippers. But this, too, was a massive mistake on Sigilun's part. She was in no position to conduct a war, with her and her daughters outnumbered by the new deities and their devotees, and she was already lacking a source of new divine power, thus her holy war lasted a brief yet horrible time. Sigilun's tantrum only served to cement the world's contempt towards her, as well as exhaust her stored divinity, devastating her beauty and leaving her a weakened crone. She retreated to the darkest, loneliest pit in existence, and her remaining daughters fled to the darker reaches of the world. Sigilun's bitterness and hatred were infused into her divine blessings, turning the prophets, songs, and protectors of Sigilun into the first sea, green, and anise hags. Thus did Sigilun begin to brew her wicked schemes, planning revenge for the indignation she suffered at the hands of countless mortal races and the usurper deities that took her place as the goddess of the night. End quote. Reminds me very much of what Guanadao did when he went ballistic and burned the intelligence of about 99% of the Ur's species in the multiverse. Bad idea. So, hags are drawn to Hades. It's the evil version of Elysium, the flip side of the same coin, basically. It is the battleground of the blood war, rife with disease and roaming bands of hordelings, which definitely will be covered in a video very soon. Plus the wretched Hades chickens, 
The Diaka are what passes for the nasty, bickering, wretched culture. As Diaka are not unintelligent animals, they are sapient, but mostly quite stupid, petty and self-involved to ever really organize themselves to do anything for the greater benefit of their own kind, over their own selfish goals. They're also so stupid that they reliably allow themselves to be fooled into serving more powerful beings who invariably end up cooking and eating them after they're done with whatever they con the Diaka into doing for them. Diaka collectively never learn this lesson. It's just not in their nature to think they're going to be a victim of the same fate. They're too arrogant for that. Their constant fear and yet totally unrealistic opinion of their own power is both ridiculous and terrible to witness. To the hags and other evil beings of the plains, the Diaka are easy pickings and seemingly exist in infinite numbers. They generally know there are different types of Diaka, but don't really bother to learn much about what the Diaka do when not being hunted, manipulated, enslaved, and eaten. Nobody cares. Thankfully, there is plenty of lore on this, but it's not all from Dungeons & Dragons. The Diaka lore is greatly expanded in Pathfinder, or perhaps has just been done in a better job of gathering the lore from older editions of D&D, Dragon Magazine, and Dungeon Magazine. After all, Piezo publishing Dragon for many years um, paid off, so I'm going to break with tradition and meld this stuff into Forgotten Realms and Planescape lore a bit better for you and include some homebrew. In the end, it's just a better understanding of the Diaka and the nature of existence in the realm of Hades and the Lower Plains culture. Also, it's a bit of laziness on my part as I just get to quote some Pathfinder lore for you, but hey, it's Hades. Expending effort is almost illegal in Hades, so I'm on brand for the theme. There are three subspecies of Diaka. They are the common Carcine, the Varath, and the rare, very intelligent Sarkox. So let's delve into some Pathfinder homebrew from the amazing Nicholas Herald from the Creature Codex on Tumblr and official, he says with a hefty dose of salt, Pathfinder lore. First off, here is basically all you need, 5th edition stat block wise, for the common Carcine Diak and also the, the Varak as well. In a nutshell, the Varath are taller and stalk-like. The Carcine are short and broad, more like squat pelicans with dodo looking heads. The head has a much larger brain case than any bird. The Carcine have a deeper burbling croak for a voice. The Varak have a sharper voice, as much like their sharper stabbing beaks that they use in combat. The Carcine are more liable just to tear prey apart with their claws. Their tactic is to swarm at prey and overcome with superior numbers. On their own, they're pathetic, cowardly creatures, but they survive in Hades. There's no such thing as a weakling creature that survives and thrives there like the Diaka do. For this stat block, can apply to either species. Just use more stabbing beak attacks for the Barath and more claw attacks for the Carcine. And keep in mind, while technically one species is more nocturnal than the other, in Hades that doesn't matter. There is no sun or moon visible in any part of Hades unless a god puts one there for some purpose, such as the artificial moon that Seculoon stages many of her powerful rituals under. Oh, important note, for the planner travels such as those adventurers reaching Hades from Toril, your common tongue is next to useless there. Unless you are talking with one of the many beings who can understand and speak all languages, as common as dark vision on the world of Toril, you'll need to speak or understand Infernal. The Diaka speak it as well as the language of the night hags that is spoken among them at the night markets. Yeah, the place has its own languages. It's that old and that big. Plus, the Diaka speak their own language. Nobody bothers to learn it. Also, technically, you could play a Diak as a player character species, I guess, but I would have to stress that they're not very smart with an intelligence of 10 for a car scene considered brilliant. The average intelligence is 7 or 8 for most Diaka, aside from the Sarkox. The Sarkox would be unlikely to go on adventures outside of Hades, though they are rare and generally stay away from other creatures. The lore in the Monstrous Manual has some weird but cool art for the Diaka that certainly went more humanoid and less avian, giving them a look more like Skeksis from the Dark Crystal, which is not that far off. A lot of Diaka do clothe themselves in once fine garments, now little more than mouldering rags, and carry themselves with ridiculous pomp and arrogance. They're also utterly cruel and merciless bullies who eat any creature that is weaker than them, and join in on the screaming maelstrom of Diaka and hordlings that swarm and devour much larger creatures that perish on the plain. And of course, they feed on whatever creatures that fall in the endless wastes of the blood war battlegrounds. The demons and devils don't leave behind corpses, of course, but they certainly bring a lot of creatures that do, the Sladi included, who lose huge numbers from getting too close to the action, as chaos and violence tends to attract them as it does demons, who are drawn to violence like a magnet. The Hordlings prove that quite well. It's only a matter of minutes before any combat in Hades draws on some damned Hordlings. Once you see one, just run for it. Any direction, doesn't matter, you're probably already surrounded. 
So every creature eats every other creature in Hades, including their own kind. It's just normal for the lower planes. The Diaco are the most commonly eaten because they are plentiful and relatively easy to catch and kill. Also, the meat doesn't spoil. It's already packed with disease and parasites. Basically, you just end up with piles of dead Diaco meat bloated parasites after a while. The nutritional value is about the same, and creatures that need to eat in the lower planes cannot afford to be fussy. With the spells available in that stat block provided, the Diaka can make audible illusions, not visual ones generally, and their powers are related to the nature of Hades to drain strength, will, and vitality. Other than innovation and a ray of enfeeblement as a touch attack, they can use magic to jump, and that's about it. Their sound illusion is almost always used to make a sound like there are many more Diaka close by, on the way. Uh, used when a Diak is caught alone and freaking out that it's about to get murdered. But they also do it to distract so that they can encircle their prey and using their innovating ritual, uh, which is listed in the stat block there. I won't go into detail about it. Just basically they surround you and draw, sap all your energy. Diak also cast a version of Ray of Enfeeblement. It's just a rain, not a ranged attack, otherwise exactly the same. On a hit, the target deals only half damage with weapon attacks that use strength, but at the end of each of the target's turns, it can make a constitution saving throw against the spell. Depends The DC depends on uh, which type of Diak it is. On a success, the spell ends. Note this does not confer immunity to the Diak's further use of this power or any other Diaka. Okay, so the car scenes are also known as broad Diaka. They are squatter and more muscular of the two species. Car scenes are smaller and slower than their various cousins, but are stronger and more magically gifted. The feather colors of the all Diak are weird and garish. Orcs love them, by the way. Some mustard or pea green colored feathers. You'd have to be familiar with orcage culture, of course. But trust me, these fetch a very fine price as long as you don't tell any other orc, except for the one with all the money, that these feathers will make whoever wears one for a while become lazy, sad, stupid, and weak, which they do without any basic diabolic ward. The perfect gift for a rival orc. <clears throat> but I digress. The Carcine Dyak have more muted dull feathers than the Varric Dyak, mostly brown, black, and gray. The face of his has large wattles and pouches of naked skin and more garish colors. However, they have a variety of bird-like features, and there are Carcines that resemble pelicans, cassowaries, turkeys, vultures, and combinations thereof. Carcines are more ambitious than their Varric cousins, and the Dyaka clan with a large number of Carcines may become especially ambitious and dangerous. They hate uh, the Yugoloths, but they know that they would lose in direct conflicts with many uh, of their number. They therefore work on sabotaging their activities, slaying petitioners, visitors that deny the demons the pleasure, and otherwise act as irritants and disruptions, the stealing maggots from uh, night hags with one common trait. They know that magic items are good and snatch them whenever they encounter them, but most have no idea how to use them, so they just fight over the pretty thing endlessly and you never know where it will end up. Probably part of some trophy pile or shrine for some dominant flock seeking to declare their, their supremacy for the ages in a land where nobody could care less. Carcine Dyak stand around 5 feet tall and weigh a good 200 pounds, so quite the Halloween mega turkey dinner there. Now, the Varath are also known as Tall Dyaka. They're dim-witted and weaker than their Carcine cousins, but much faster. The speed in the 5e stat block would apply to the Varath Dyak. The Carcine are no faster than a running human, but they can jump a lot better. Varath are always subordinate to the superior numbers of Carcine, but will turn the tables if they can, with glee, often to the detriment of all the Diaka because they are in the middle of combat and they just notice that now they outnumber the Carcine and decide to turn on them, which can be highly confusing for whatever they're fighting, until the Hordling show up and everyone makes a run for it. So that's just a level of intelligence that they have. Dim-witted, turning on each other in the middle of combat, on brand for the Diaka. They're Avian features cause them to resemble cranes, herons, storks, ibis, and combinations thereof. Their beaks have tooth-like jagged structures that can spread supernaturally intense pain. They are relatively few magical talents, but use them in combat appropriately, using enfeeblement to weaken heavily armored foes, and minor illusion to create sound as a distraction are favorite tactics, as I mentioned. Varith are faster than a horse and are exceptional acrobats, and gladly use hit-and-run tactics to wear down foes before finishing them off. They are likely to use Dance of Weakness only if in a protected position where enemies have a hard time reaching them. They are very cowardly. Most Varaths are stupid, cruel, and somewhat gullible creatures with an inflated opinion of their own savviness. Many other Varaths that serve as guards or mercenaries for a demon or a night hag 
only to be murdered by their master when it is no further use for them. They are clannish among their own groups of Diaka. When two flocks meet, they typically exchange threats and insults at a distance, kind of like dogs barking at each other through fences. The Wrath stands about eight feet tall and weighs about 300 pounds. They have hollow bones and their flesh is tough, oily, and tastes like a few day old discarded turkey meat warmed gently by the feral humidity existing within the confines of a decomposing corpse. Let's not forget that the first layer of Hades is like the birthplace of diseases. It's practically the happy afterlife of all past plagues and the birthing pit of all future microbial horrors, yet to infest the flesh of the living and the dead alike. If you're not totally immune to disease, eating diaca meat is going to kill you in very nasty and random ways, I assure you. Some folks wonder why the hags came to thrive in the grim eternity of Hades, but it's simple really. Anyone who has been travelling from one place to another and they have to pass through a terminally boring, miserable stretch of just nothing, a blur of unremarkable sameness that really would, you'd only stop in order to relieve your bowels of waste. That is Hades. It connects via the river Styx and naturally occurring giant metallic portals to other lower planes. You can simply walk or float from Hades to Arborea, Isgard, Olympus, Carceri, any number of lesser known astral domains of the lower planes, but much more on Hades in future vids in this little mini-series during this month. Finally, the Sarkox, a homebrew of Nicholas Herald from the Creature Codex on Tumblr, and I quote, The Sarkox Diaka is a much larger bird-like creature. They're solitary and aloof. If one ever gets a rare glimpse of the true extent of Hades past the ever-present mist and fog, which you can only see about 200 feet through, the Sarkox can be seen perched on high places, watching over things below them, always somewhere just past a few hundred feet away. They have a featherless head with a weirdly fleshy beak filled with jagged fangs and its body is covered in a coat of greasy grey feathers. Instead of the wings, it has long arms that ne drag nearly to the ground. They're also known as Giant Dyak and is both stronger and more intelligent than any other Dyaka. The Sarkox are patient and voyeuristic creatures, obsessing with observing as much as they can. Most of a Sarkox's life is spent invisibly perched watching the comings and goings of its denizens and cataloguing a list of potential blackmail targets or valuable intelligence. Sarkoxes are mercenary with their information, selling it to the highest bidder. Although they are resentful of daemons, the Euglos, they will happily deal with them, preferring to encourage them to battle each other and waste their own time and resources, weakening them and so on. In combat, a Sarkox's gaze can sap the strength of mortal muscles, uh, leaving a battlefield full of twitching, helpless foes for the Dyak to murder at its leisure, so they project an innovating ray through their eyes. Its bite is charged with negative energy, and they wield more powerful spells than their kin. I leave it up to you. Most Sarkoxes view other types of Dyak with derision, but are more than happy to use them for their own purposes, fighting from within a mass of allies to absorb blows and split enemy attention. A Sarkox stands about 20 feet tall. Their lightweight bones and lean frames give them a weight of about a ton, and it is rare to actually fight one unless it's pretty certain you are hopelessly outnumbered and already just about dead. Such is the nature of Hades. Things can always get worse there. Next up, exploring the night markets and the machinations of the night hags. My name is AJ Pickett. Thanks for tuning in to another Monster Ecology Lore video. I have plenty more, hundreds of them. Feel free to explore and if you choose to support me via YouTube premium subscription or by watching a few ads in my video or by donating a buck a month on Patreon or Subscribestar or a one-off PayPal donation which is connected to my email address, then thank you very much. You're one of the folks that allows me to concentrate on this stuff as a full-time job and keep me eating right and working out so I can keep making videos until you have to pry my cold dead hands from my keyboard. To quote Isaac Asimov, when asked what he would do if he found out he only had a few months to live, I would just write faster. Thanks for listening. As always, I'll be back with more for you very soon.